Oh, okay. I got it. If you wanted to have a private conversation, Hello, everybody. Yeah. We are going to start. And uh, Wes Codwell is going to present his first talk about drinking the hashtag uh, with Apache Solar and OpenNLP. Thanks. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay. Well, I guess we can get started. Basically, um, if you guys have been in uh, this room at the Lucene and Friends track, you've probably seen a lot of talks about you know, the technology of solar and Lucene and some of the details of that. This is more of a talk around use case of how we're applying the technology for our customers. Um, so this is really going to dive into how we're building a search and analytics app that helps our customers what I call shrink the haystack, our analysts. Um, so. so some of the topics I'm going to cover just an introduction. I'm Wes Caldwell. I work for a company called ISS. Um, just an introduction to our company and some of our customers that we service, primarily in the federal and DOD space. Um, some of the data challenges our customers are facing, which will not be unlike the challenges that your customers are facing. Maybe a different problem domain, but really a similar big data problem that we're facing pretty much across the industry. Um, just kind of dive a little bit into our data processing pipeline and how we kind of put solar and NLP into that pipeline and how that provides value to our customers. And then the document processing ecosystem, as I put it. And this is really how we're applying a lot of Apache technologies along with other technologies to process documents and put those into a search index and allow the users to interact with that search index. Um, and then some additional, maybe some sort of niche solar features that we use that are actually really practical, but they really are very powerful for our users. So I'll go into some details about that. <clears throat> and then um, some of the NLP, NLP techniques that we use. We use two distinct techniques, and I'll kind of compare and contrast and go over kind of what, what the differences between those are, and we'll, we'll walk through that. And then, and then really why, why we would use multiple NLP techniques and how that provides value. And then I have a quick demo of, of the app that we're building for our customer just to kind of show you a manifestation of, of all the technologies that we've talked about. OK, so just a little bit about ISS. Um, <clears throat> we are a uh, company headquartered here in Colorado, um, about 800 employees. And we do primarily, a, a majority of our business is done in the federal and the Department of Defense space. So public, uh, you know, local law enforcement, government, Department of Defense, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> so we have a lot of customers around the world that we service. Uh, for example, currently we have engineers in Afghanistan today with our troops um, supporting a product that we roll out there. Um, but an interesting fact about sort of our business model is within the government space, we give away our software for free and we sell services to that software. So it's what's called the GOTS model, basically. So that model um, essentially provides the government free licenses to our software, and then we provide the services on top of that. Kind of an interesting model. It's been successful for us, but just kind of comparing it to a traditional commercial model, it's a little different. Um, <clears throat> and just to give you kind of a feel for some of our, some of our programs and some of our uh, uh, customer base, we span the spectrum from space, space command and control to air operations. So basically, operations that run uh, air warfare. We do maritime, national, like within the DC Beltway area, joint operations. And I know a lot of these are acronyms that you know, probably are, are not sort of, or they're sort of foreign to everybody in the room. But, but the joint operations like US CENTCOM, which runs the operations in Afghanistan and Iraq. Two R and D machine learning type uh, efforts and programs, all the way down to the ground level, which is boots on the ground, uh, Army, Air Force, etc. So just to kind of give you a big uh, kind of a spectrum of our customer base, and really what this what this what this means is that we have a lot of customers with a lot of use cases that help drive our products in a certain direction, and a large piece of that use case is the big data search use case. And pervasive across all of our customers, there's a need for essentially data management. How can I manage my data? How can I provide 
a searchable, a way to get to my data in an efficient way, search is an enabler of that. So let's <clears throat> back up a little bit. The data challenge that we're facing, and this is not, obviously this is pervasive through all industries, I, is, is my perception. I saw this in this infographic from CSC a while back, and it, it kind of highlights really the challenge we're facing with data today. Um, most of the information is now moving from traditional relational data stores to unstructured and semi-structured data. And this is true in our customer base as well. Um, and, you know, that infographic just highlights that, you know, data production will be 44 times greater in 2020 than in 2009. So it's just the explosion of the ability to produce and collect data that is really the challenge here. And we're seeing this in our, in our realms, in our customer base, as well as I'm sure you guys are seeing in yours as well. Um, and actually, in the keynote, Hillary Mason mentioned that she had that picture of, uh, of President Obama on the stage, and everybody had a device, and they were all taking pictures. So that's just kind of like indicative of, you know, everybody, every, everything is a sensor today, right? Everything can collect and produce information. And it's not uh, foreign in our realms as well, in, in, in our federal and DOD space. There's a lot of sensors. There's a lot of production of data. And our challenge is really how can we manage and collect and, 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 and provide discernible information from that, from that data. So, and obviously the fact that, you know, there's an incredible amount of information that's dormant within unstructured data. And it's really trying to extract, you know, that information is really the key to allowing our customers to kind of exploit the information that they're getting. So in our, in our, in our customers' data environment, there are literally thousands of data sources and feeds from a variety of strategic, national, and tactical sources. So media is a big one. Documents, images. I mean, obviously, you know, everything in this list is obvious, uh, uh, you know, pieces of information that we're trying to collect. Media is a big piece of that. There's tons of documents, tons of images in this, in this domain, and there's information in those documents and those images that we want to extract. Human interaction, so that we call that soldier as a sensor. And basically that's, you know, any interaction that a human would have with, with another human gets recorded, um, as you can, you know, and so, I mean, as you could imagine, right? And so that information gets collected into systems and you want to actually look at, okay, what are, what are the interactions and how, you know, what, trying to derive intent and other types of things from that information. Geospatial information, a huge, huge source of information, obviously. Um, everywhere from just basic infrastructure. I mean, you know, anybody goes to Google Maps today, they can see every hotel in the Denver area. They can see every infrastructure piece from a power plant to, to the water, water facility or whatever it is. There's tons of geospatial information, and that information is critical to kind of correlating that information with other information to kind of draw conclusions. Open source information, obviously Twitter, news feeds like BBC, uh, et cetera. Th these are huge amounts of, large volume amounts of information that, that are ingested and sort of analyzed every day. And there's many, many more. Imagery, obviously, that's a, that's a huge piece. Um, but this, this data environment is just very large. It's growing by, the, by the, the day, the month, the year. And all this information has to be collected and managed in sort of a discernible way that allows us to start kind of drawing connections between that information. Correlation of that information is really a key piece of this. So really, this is just, you know, sort of a visual of how our analysts feel. So an analyst's job is to kind of pull that information in together into sort of a common environment. And we provide the tools that the environment essentially provides that we provide the tools that pull that information in. And our analysts feel like they're sitting on this massive haystack of information, and they're trying to just whittle that down to a discernible amount where they could say, okay, I'm trying to focus on a particular area of the world, trying to focus on a particular problem domain, et cetera. And so they feel like they're just sitting on this mountain of information. How do I get control of this? How do I kind of whittle this down so I can then, as a human, make a, a, a better decision on the information? instead of just being overwhelmed by the mass, you know, the sheer mass of the information. 
So really the need here is that <clears throat> analysts are really looking for, you know, they're looking to extract knowledge from that massive information set, and they're providing what they call actionable intelligence. So it's just something that can be actioned on. Like, do I know that there is a, you know, potentially a counter-narcotics, a drug smuggling effort that's going on in Colombia today? It's that, you know, that's a, just an example. Um, they're trying to look for actionable information. And so search and NLP really provide, is, they're really key enablers to um, allow that analyst to sort of search that information, search for information they know about, but also help them discover information they don't know about. And so the combination of search and NLP kind of give the one-two punch to allow them to, to do that. And so it, and it's obviously critical, especially in tactical environments, because in tactical environments, the, co the communication pipes are very, very thin or very small. I had, had it described in the past of trying to suck a watermelon through a soda straw, right? You're trying to get a lot of information, but you only have a small pipe to push that information through. So you really want to whittle that information down to just the essential elements and then provide that to an analyst potentially in the field, potentially back here, uh, you know, within the continental United States as well. And you're allowing them to shrink that haystack to a manageable, digestible size that allows them to start looking at that information using their, you know, using their brains, essentially, using their, their human elements that a computer cannot emulate, and looking and you know, trying to understand what the information they're looking at. So what we've done along these lines is we really want to push that information through an analytics pipeline. And that analytics pipeline can be targeted at a particular domain. And for example, a couple, couple of domains that we deal with, counterterrorism and counter-narcotics, are two, two example domains. So you can kind of, you can build pipelines that actually target, looking, look for certain pieces in that information related to those domains. And, and you know, a real critical piece here is that the time to live on that information is very short, right? So if you're trying to, um, you know, uh, potentially track a counter-narcotics activity. Drug smuggling across the border is a good example. The time to live on that is very short. Once it happens, it's done. You can't do anything about it. So the information you're collecting and you're trying to analyze is time critical and you've got to act on it quickly. So again, it's not really about finding the needle in the haystack per se. It, you know, computers are only going to help you so far. Analytics are only going to help you so far. And they can only be trusted to a certain extent. There's still that human in the loop. So we need to really whittle down the information into a discernible amount that allows the analyst to, uh, to make an informed decision. So basically, we're using analytics and computing power to kind of give that analyst a smaller subset of information so they can make an informed decision. It's not about eliminating the human in the loop. It's not about any of that. It's about using analytics and, and search to kind of whittle down that haystack. So kind of where our journey led us, um, it wasn't to a remote part in Alaska. Uh, it was about pipelining information in a certain way using a, a set of technologies and largely Apache technologies to kind of allow us to process this information, large amounts of information. So here's our basic approach. First and foremost, you know, we have what's called content acquisition. You know, not rocket science here. Everybody does content acquisition in their, in their big data pipelines. But basically, we're kind of uh, pulling structured, unstructured, and semi-structured information through a variety of mechanisms using traditional data integration patterns, using <clears throat> uh, big data sort of integration patterns like things like Logstash and Flume and other, other uh, ecosystem components, putting those into what we call the content cache. And those are really the haystacks that we're talking about the large cache of information. And so some characteristics of this particular component of our system, you know, you gotta have a connector architecture, something to be able to connect to multiple data sources, mine relational stores, mine uh, social media feeds, mine uh, web content, if you will, news feeds, et cetera, RSS, et cetera. You gotta be able to normalize that information into some discernible form, so then the further steps down the pipeline can, can manage it. Um, you have to stage that information, and really important for us is 
the security aspect around it, which is compartmentalizing that information. So if you're, you, you go into an organization like the FBI or Depart Department of Homeland Security or something, they, they want to take certain siphons of information and put them just into different buckets and allow different people have access to different information. Basic security, security problem, but, but really critical to our customer base. So the next step <clears throat> is putting that content into a form that is searchable, that you can discover information from that. Obviously, we're using Apache Solar for that. So we're pushing that information into Solar. And again, some of the characteristics of this, this particular component of our system, logical component of our system, is it's an optimized index for search and discovery. So that's the inverted index of Solar, right, Lucene. Um, we have a management on top of that allows analysts to sort of create standing queries, save their queries, which we call topics. Essentially, they can search for information with certain filters, whether that be geospatial, temporal, keyword, obviously, and put those into buckets and say, okay, this is everything that's happening in the Helmand province of Afghanistan or something like that. They could just bucketize that and say, here's all the information I want in this problem. Here's all the information that's happening in along the border of Mexico and the U.S. or something like that. So, so the topics are real critical because that can, just allows them to organize information and start whittling down that large content cache and that search index into just a smaller sized amount that they can deal with. Um, obviously, we use the advanced features of solar, fastening and autocomplete. We actually have added in some additional things with tagging and commenting, sort of like a social media aspect to an analyst's workspace, so where they can actually provide comments like, you know, just whatever they want to add and augment to that, so other analysts, they can kind of collaborate and share information in that sense. And then we actually use a, uh, the synonym capability of solar. We call it semantic search. And that allows us to kind of derive synonyms for keywords. So, um, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later, some of the details around that. But it really, it's, it's based on what we call pluggable taxonomies. So within our, within our customer bases, there are things called taxonomies, which are really hierarchical synonym sets that define a domain. So a real simple example could be something like, I want to define a weapon. And a weapon includes an M16, an AK-47, et cetera, et cetera, right? A Glock. And so as you define those, now when you do searches, you can say, I can search for weapons, and I can get back everything that references an M16 or an AK-47. So it's a real simple, powerful way to kind of load in these taxonomies and allow enhance the search experience for the user. So obviously search is a, the centerpiece of this system um, enabled by solar. So then we add in the NLP element. We call it semantic enrichment. This is where we get into the categorization, the named entity recognition, the clustering, all the types of things that NLP and algorithms do well. Um, so we, we support uh, what we call domain spaces, which is a pluggable entity recognition and categorization engine. So depending on your domain, you might want to categorize your information differently. So if I'm taking a, a general feed from the internet, just a news feed, for example, but I'm looking for particular elements of that news feed related to certain domains, like counterterrorism or drug trafficking or whatever it may be, you're going to tune your domain, your NLP, to look for different types of triggers or, and elements of that text. So a news article on... Uh, you know, riots in Pakistan might be something you'd be interested in versus something that happened in, you know, Michigan or something like that. So you might want to filter that out based on your NLP categorization. And so, and it's a continuous feedback loop. So as information comes in, you want to continuously evaluate that information. Um, and this is a really, you know, again, a key, a key piece of that pipeline. The other key piece that we're working on, which is more difficult, obviously, is allowing the analyst or the user of the system to input what is important to them. So they can tune, so we can preload a set of categorization algorithms, but if the user can't say, that's not what I want, not like that, but more like this, it doesn't help the system learn over time and become better. So that's really a key piece, and that's, that's a piece that we're actively working on. That's not solved, but it is a key piece that analyst input is very critical to this process. 
So you can tune the system over time and it can learn and become better at finding what the analyst is looking for. And then um, the, next, the next key piece here is really what we call data perspective. So it's really just, this is the analytics, an additional sort of sidecar of analytics where in like Hadoop and other, other ecosystems, we can kind of take that corpus of information that lives in that, in that content cache and similar to how we push it into a search index, into an optimized search form, we can, we can whittle that information into graph forms, time series databases, anything that we would want to take a slice of that information and put it into a different form that allows the analyst to interact with it in a different way. So potentially look at the information on a timeline, per se, in a more optimized form. So this is where we enter into the, the, you know, the, the MapReduce worlds and the, and the analytics worlds of Hadoop. And that's, that's really uh, powerful for us as well. So <clears throat> this is kind of just a window into our document processing ecosystem. Um, we deal with, obviously, since it's, since it's a lot of unstructured information, we deal with everything as a document. And <clears throat> just kind of going through the, the, the steps, I mean, these steps aren't exactly, in, I mean, perfectly in order. Sometimes they're done in different order. But here's kind of like the basic ingestion mechanism of a document and kind of the life of a document in our system. And then down below is just kind of a representation of the technologies that we use um, to, to accomplish the goals, right, of what we're doing with the document. So obviously you, you bring a document in and you're going to manage it, right? You want to manage it in some content management system. We use two sort of mechanisms for that. Apache Jackrabbit, which is a JCR, a Java Content Repository. We use that, and we also use HDFS. So those are like kind of our two basic content repositories, if you will. Um, then as you move down the, the stack, you move that document down the pipeline, you're doing things like text extraction. Obviously, Tika, Apache Tika is, is great for that. It can take multiple data formats, like Word documents, PDFs, et cetera, and turn those into, you know, essentially textify those, those documents. So uh, Boilerpipe is another... It's actually a, a, a Google Code uh, contribution, and um, it, it does website scraping. So it can pull HTML and textify HTML very easily, or websites. So very powerful for us. And then you start getting into the NLP steps, the named entity recognition, you know, the NLP type, type uh, uh, processing. And that's where you get into the what we, uh, Apache Wema, which is probably an not a very well-known project under the Apache ecosystem, but we use it heavily. Um, unstructured information management architecture, and I'll go into detail about some of the, what, how we use that, that system. And then you get into the open NLPs and the gate. Those are the, the uh, NLP processing engines, um, and we use those heavily as well. Uh, geospatial tagging, if you just move down the line there. Geospatial tagging, we're actually looking for obviously um, uh, references and text to places. Uh, so if that was you know, Paris, France, or something like that, we want to associate a latitude and longitude to those references, those, those, those geonames. So we leverage the Geonames database, which is a open source uh, geo-resolution uh, database that basically takes a name, gives you a lat long. So obviously, in text, if it says, hey, in uh, Dallas, Texas, you know, something happened, you can resolve Dallas, Texas to the centroid lat long of the, of the city. You're not going to resolve it to the particular neighborhood, if you will. Um, but Geonames does that really well for us. And then you get to the whole clustering and classification, and that's still kind of involving the gate and NLP, where you're trying to categorize information, and I'll go into some more detail on that. Then obviously at the very end, we're indexing that information into, into Apache Solar, thus allowing the, the, the user to interact with that index. That's their primary touch point into our system. So you can kind of see there's a whole spectrum of technologies that we're applying and leveraging. Many in the Apache ecosystem uh, family uh, to kind of handle this document processing pipeline. So just a note on some of the um, additional solar features that we find useful. So like I mentioned before, we use the synonym capability of solar. We call it semantic search, but it is the synonym set capability within solar. 
And so what that does is, again, within our domains, we have um, taxonomies, we have lexicons that we can load in for particular domains. So if it's a, like I mentioned before, like a weapons type uh, domain where you know, you're trying to find things like weapon caches or whatever, you can load in um, these synonym sets into solar and on index time, we do actually implement it on index time, which has its strengths and weaknesses, of course. But on index time, it will, it will um, load into the index, into a field, all the synonyms associated with a particular term. And so it's real easy then, once you do a search, that you're searching on the field with the synonyms. If you search for weapons and it finds an AK-47, it'll bring up that document as well as a hit. So pretty powerful, um, pretty simple. It's real practical, but it's very, very powerful in our domains because we have analysts that know what they're looking for, right? They know that they, these terms are commonly used in this domain and they continue to update that synonym set, if you will, that lexicon over time. So we can continue to load those in and the system can continue to pull out that information relatively easily without, I mean, it, it's, I call it a practical analytic. It's not really an analytic, it's just using solar in a certain way to make it very powerful for the user. So, um, another, another thing we use is <clears throat> geospatial, in our geospatial resolution uh, capability, we actually, we actually load a, the GeoNames database into a separate solar core, okay? And we do our, and so, so instead of having the geonames in, say, a Postgres database, and we're querying that database saying, okay, I have Dallas, Texas, or I have, a, I have a word Dallas, give me a latitude and longitude, we put that into the solar core, which gives us a few distinct advantages. Okay, so obviously you can query that solar core similar to a database. You can say, here's my term, give me back a result, give me back a document, essentially, that would have that Latin long. But it allows for the really quick lookups on for entity resolution. So if we find a word like Paris, you know, we can easily just query solar and say, give me Paris, what's the Latin long? Obviously, the disambiguation of, well, was it Paris, France, or Paris, Texas, you know, depends on the context of the, te you know, the, of the document that you've ingested. But you can boost on, so within solar, you can apply boosting rules. Again, another simple use of solar in a, in a, in a unique way. You can apply boosting rules that would boost by population. Okay, if I, if I only have Paris, I have nothing else, and I don't know if it's Paris, Texas, Paris, France, or wherever, I can just say, you know what, return the one with the highest population. That's the one I'm going with. And it could be wrong, it could be right, but the point is, you can define those rules in solar, and you can change those rules. And so we could have analyst-specific rules. So we could say, um, I'm an analyst primarily focusing on uh, South American uh, drug trafficking. Okay, so when I, when, I, when I ingest my rules into the solar engine for boosting, I only want to find South American cities with certain names. I don't necessarily want some random uh, similar city name that is in Europe or Africa or wherever. So you can boost based on local conditions, which is really powerful. We can kind of restrict it to an AOR, what we call a, an area of responsibility. So. This is really powerful for us because we load that into the solar core, we can do quick lookups on geospatial entity resolution, and we can apply custom boosting rules targeted for particular customer sets. So it's very, very powerful for us. And again, a real simple application of solar in a unique way that allows us to, to kind of draw out um, some value from that, so. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, all right, so we, re we leverage two kind of distinct NLP techniques, okay? Um, WEMA is sort of the backbone against it all. So WEMA is a pipelining, NLP pipelining project. So it's a, it's a, a pipeline for different pieces of that NLP step from tokenization to limitization to all the, all the things from entity resolution and all that type of stuff. You can chain those things together in a WEMA pipeline and it's configurable. And so what, what that does for us is it sort of abstracts the underlying NLP technology we're using. So we can put uh, gazetteer-based NLP engines, we can put open NLP, which is more of a, a uh, 
Um, I'm, I'm, oh, sorry, supervised machine learning. I, I lost my train of thought there. The supervised machine learning approach. Um, so we can plug and play different pieces and parts of those, of those different NLP engines. So WEMA really gives us that, that, that kind of abstraction that we need. So as new NLP techniques come along and get invented and enhance and improve, we can continue to kind of roll with that and plug in the latest, greatest if we want, or we can stick with what we have. Whereas if we just converged on, okay, we're using open NLP or we're using gate, you're kind of locking yourself in to a certain extent. Yes, you can unplug that whole piece, but now we have a way to kind of plug in pieces and parts of each. So that's really powerful for us. And we're actually starting to use WEMA AS, which is the asynchronous version of WEMA, allowing us to scale out, provide more, you know, handle more volume of NLP tasks. NLP is a pretty expensive operation. It takes takes time to break apart a whole document, break it into its tokens, find the nouns and the verbs and the predicates and figure out all the entities you're looking for, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it, there's some overhead there. And so as much as we can scale that out, um, we're also looking at MapReduce type, you know, Hadoop type ways to do that as well. But WEMA AS has been really good for us as far as, uh, you know, that abstraction between what technology we're using and what we're trying to do with the, with the text. <clears throat> so the gate, let me talk a little bit about the gate gazetteer approach. So the gate um, general architecture for text engineering is out of the University of Sheffield in the UK. And it's a technology that's, I mean, it, it essentially uses dictionaries. So that's why I call it a gazetteer-based approach. You're doing lookups out of a large dictionary against words. So there's key terms, and we use those terms to categorize text in our documents. So for example, um, it might find a place. Within the context of the text, it's going to find the fact that there's a city name in there. And it's going to use that gazetteer approach to say, OK, I've classified this as a place. And I've classified this as a person, because it, it has the word Frank or Wes or, or whatever it may be. So it, it's really good at sort of using, a, you know, again, this dictionary-based approach to classifying text. And we use that heavily. Um, and we can, the, the, the cool thing about it is we can define a number of categories that are customer defined. So within a, a particular customer domain, they can define a dictionary that says these are, um, one of our domains is what we call the, uh, the IED domain, right? The improvised explosive device domain. That is those roadside bombs we hear about in the news all the time going off in Afghanistan, Iraq, et cetera. We can, we can use a, a, a dictionary that defines common terms around that domain to, to help categorize text that might not other, otherwise be categorized. So it's very powerful. Um, it allows us to define custom sort of domains or dictionaries that our customers are interested in. They can tune the NLP system to kind of find what they're looking for. And I'll kind of demonstrate that later. So then we talk about the open NLP. That's the other technique we use, which is the supervised machine learning approach. So that's really about being context aware, right? Understanding you know, grammar, understanding language, understanding the context of words and how they relate to each other, and what a verb and a, a noun and a predicate and all that, all that stuff is. So these, these are very powerful as well. They're based on probabilistic theory called maximum entropy. And they're very powerful, but they, you have to train them. You have to train them for your corpus of information. And that's the difficulty, right? So it requires data scientists and SMEs to actually sit down and say, in our domain, these words mean these types of things. Um, a, 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 a good example is, you know, in a, in a uh, take something like a washing machine or a washing machine timer or a garage door opener, okay? So these things, when I talk about them in a, uh, you know, a sort of a, just, you know, at, these are things that, are live, that exist in our house. We have a garage door opener, we have a washing machine, yada, yada, yada. But in other domains, a garage door opener could be a trigger device for a bomb, or a washing machine timer could trigger an IED to go off on a roadside bomb. So you wanna be able to tune your, your language, your lexicon, to the domain you're looking for. Um, so in you know, different domains, things mean different things. Uh, obviously, different things have different contexts in different domains. So the point is, 
to train an open NLP, to train those models, it requires subject matter experts in those domains to sit down and actually work very hard to get that model to be tuned. So the question is, why do we use you know, both NLP approaches, right? So obviously they both have pros and cons. And, and really combining them provides the maximum power for us. So the gazetteer approach, again, that dictionary-based approach, I have a bag of words, I'm looking for these bag of words, categorize the information as it comes in if it fits these bag of words, basically. It's very precise, right? You're going to find exactly what you're looking for. If you're looking for, you know, Acura, Ford, Chevy, whatever you're looking for, and you're saying those are cars, those are, every time you find that word Chevy, that's a car. Categorize it as a vehicle. You're going to find that every time. It's very precise. So you're going to find what you know and what's important to you. So that, that's really important in our domains because our analysts know what they're looking for most of the time. But they also want to know, they also want you to find what they're not looking for, hence the other approach. Um, so yeah, it's really precise. It's simple for analysts to tune, right? It's as simple as updating a, word, a bag of words list, a dictionary, if you will. Right? It does not require a data scientist. All it requires is somebody that knows what they're looking for. Um, and it's quick and easy to add new categories. So we could say, I'm looking for vehicles, so I'll look for Chevy, Ford, Honda. And now, you, now you can say, you know what, I want another category now. I want to look for you know, fast food brands. Okay, now look for McDonald's, Burger King, and Taco Bell. Okay, you can add that in, lickety-split, it's up and running in five minutes. Now you're, now you're categorizing all the documents that come in based on vehicle types and fast food brands or whatever. So you can change that on the fly. It's real quick, real easy, and it's real powerful for our analysts. So the cons, it's only as good as that bag of words that you create. It's only as good as that bag of words. So it's not context aware. It's not going to help you find new things, like another vehicle type that you don't know about. I only know that Chevy, Ford, and Honda. Oh, I forgot about Toyota. Well, it's not going to find Toyota for you because you didn't put it in the bag of words. So obviously there's pros and cons of that gazetteer approach. The supervised machine learning approach, you know, the pros on that is once you properly train the model, it's good at finding co new concepts. So it can find you the, the new context of that car or that fast food brand or that person or that organization that you're looking for. Um, and this, this graphic on the side here is just sort of a representative approach to how you do supervised machine learning. You have to, you take a, you take a, you start with a base model, some, your golden set of data, you train it and you just iterate through and through this thing, feed it more data, feed it more data, feed it more data, and, and, and really data scientists and SMEs have to sit down and actually provide a lot of work and effort around that. But once that, once that model's tuned and trained, you have to continue to update it, but once it's there, it's very good at what it does. That's why, that's why it exists. Um, you know, and, and some, like I brought up, the, it requires a data scientist, it requires a SME to produce quality models. So you have to invest that money and time into that. So, so the bottom line is, you know, a combined approach helps you find the things you know you're looking for that you know are relevant, and also helps you find the things that are relevant that you don't really know about. So that combination of open NLP and gate, in our case, the, sort of the dictionary-based model and the supervised machine learning, really give us that, that powerful one-two punch. And that's why we use both. So just some additional information on on uh, you know, some of the projects that we're using. I did want to bring up, see if I can do it real quick. It's going to let me. So this is just an example. This is one of our, this is our, our, say our demo system on our VPN here. And so I can, you know, you can see that it's your traditional search system, right? So this is a manifestation of all the things I just talked about. It's your traditional search system where I've got data coming in. I'm kind of showing that, that live feed. I can do keyword searches. Obviously, this is straight up solar. Oh, see, I think I timed out on my... Sorry, hold on a sec. Apologize on that. Hopefully it'll load. Kind of over a VPN. It's kind of slow comms here. Oh, come on. Of course, when I uh, 
There we go. Okay. All right. So, so you can do your traditional keyword type type searches. For example, I know that there was some voting in uh, Afghanistan and Hungary, so I'm looking for something like that. There you go. Um, I can bring up a record, and this is where the NLP stuff comes into play. We're doing entity en entity highlighting. Give it a second again. Slow slow internet here. So you can see that we're highlighting text here. Things like people, President Karzai, places, Kabul, Afghanistan, right? Uh, you know, some of these are incorrectly categorizing because obviously you have to tune that. Uh, Taliban's an organization. So you can see how it's extracting text and annotating that text in this document here. I can go to the original news article, again, just referencing back to the actual original data. Um, probably going to be very slow there. Um, and, then, and then you can see on this side here, we're, we're doing the categorization. The NLP is categorizing people, places, things, right? So you've got people, organizations, locations. And these are all based off of the, solar, the fields in the solar index that, that are, are categorizing you know, the, the NLP tokenization and, and the identification of those entities as categories like people, places, and things. And then it's, we're just faceting on that and showing that there's a, there's a lot of references to President Vladimir Putin. And I can click on that, and it's going to whittle down my results to Putin and voting, I guess, at this point. I can take that off. So, so just, you know, just wanted to show you kind of this. I mean, this, this is real software that we're building for our customers, but it's allowing them to categorize their information, whittle down that haystack, get to the, the meat of what they're looking for, create what we call topics, which are just bucketized uh, uh, search results, essentially. And um, we're very powerful for our users. Um, very, uh, very powerful, sorry, for our users. And I know I'm running out of time, so I'm going to jump to the... Any questions? Uh, yeah, sorry. Excuse me? <clears throat> Hello. Uh, great talk. Is is there a way? So you showed um, organizations highlighted. Yeah. Uh, and you said some are incorrectly categorized. Yeah. Is there a way for the user to signal that to you so that you can use that we're, for training we're purposes? We're and, and I mentioned that earlier. It's like that is that analyst feedback is really critical, and we're working on it. It's an active project, so we're trying to get to the point where they can say no, not a not a person, not a person, not a person, or maybe categorize it themselves to say that's an organization. You didn't know that. FUBAR is an organization, but it is. Um, well, for example, funny, funny thing is, uh, you know, Al Jazeera. It identified Al Jazeera as a person, Al Jazeera. And it's like, no, 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 that's a news agency, you know. So, so same kind of thing. It's like <laughs> you'll get into these situations where you're just like, okay, the computer can get you so far, but the, the human in the loop has got, is critical to that, right? So, yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, you mentioned about the synonym list. Uh, is yeah. it also as part of the gates? Uh, you you use that uh, the analyst manually actually identify those. Like yeah. So the synonym capability. So there's two distinct differences there. The synonym capability in Solar is really around. That's part of Solar. You load in those synonym sets, and it indexes on the way in. It'll say, "Oh, I found." Uh, um, you know, I found Chevy, I'm going to put vehicle, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tag the index with some information that I can facet on later. Within gate, it's a dictionary of terms. It's not necessarily synonyms, but that could contain synonyms. So it, it, gate, same kind of way, it was gate's analyzing the text. It's looking at the gazetteer or the dictionary to say, I'm going to categorize. And you're really trying to, at that point, categorize it in a, you know, say a person, place, or thing, or whatever you want to categorize it as, vehicle, fast food restaurant, whatever it is, the, the dictionaries are based around those categories you're looking for in your text. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, I'm sorry. And, and yes, we have, there's, a, again, active project. We're, we're building a UI where analysts can go in and add to that dictionary or create new categories. So if they're like, I'm looking for, you know, candy bar brands or something like that, they can now create a new category and add in the dictionary words that they're looking for. So if you find you know, Snickers or Hershey's or something like that, you can categorize that as this document contains references to candy bars or something like that. So it's a, it's a, it's a user in the loop type thing. We're building UIs around that. I have another question. Somebody else. <clears throat> so 
Um, uh, maybe you already addressed this. Uh, do you also use the context of the document to realize, like you mentioned Paris, for example, is it Paris, Texas, or Paris, uh, uh, France? And, uh, and that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of, if I, if I get to just your question, it's kind of why we use Open NLP and we use the Gate Gazetteer. We kind of use both together, whereas Open NLP gives us that context. So it tries to classify information based on, or entity, it tries to resolve entities based on context. Like, I know this is a noun, so this is probably a person, place, or thing. And I know this is a verb, so they're acting on this or whatever. So does that make sense? Or the I'm answer? Not about the, actually, I'm not talking about at the index time or uh, beforehand. I'm talking about at the search time. Let's say you uh, the analyst type in Paris. Uh, return all the documents that has Paris and maybe ta Texas in it for them. Oh, I see what you're saying. We, we could, we, yeah. Uh, we have actually the developers on on, on, to, on the project here, and maybe after this we could we could have that discussion. But you can answer it. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, right, right now we're currently working on improving that, uh, utilizing other information, <laughs> other annotations within that document. So uh, if further ahead we find another, you know, city within Paris, or within France. That we could say, you know, this is probably Paris, France versus Paris, Texas, or vice versa. If we find the the document talks about other other cities within Texas, we could say, you know, more than likely this whole document is talking about the same kind of area. So that's that's a work in progress that we're doing right now. What what it is is um, this is by identifying these relationships in the document. Maybe at the uh, how, how how are you thinking of approaching it? Is that the index time? Add, put additional tags on the document. So in that, that specific case where I was talking about where we're trying to disambiguate the the Paris, we're going to do that during the the NLP NLP time. At least our original slot's going to be like that uh, for before indexing. So we'll we'll have yeah. that satisfied before the indexing time. I think that'd probably be the best approach. So there, yeah, there's um, definitely a trade-off between query time and index time on certain. We, we've pick and choose which, you know, like for example, on index time we did the synonym matching where you could do it at query time, but there's a lot of overhead in that. So, and there's some bugs in uh, that implementation. So we kind of balance, you're right, I mean, there's, there's trade-offs on either way, index or query, if you try to, you know, mine relationships or you're trying to find synonyms at query and index time. So, I'm Thank you very time. much. All right, uh, thank you. I'm thank afraid you. there is no more time for questions. All right. Thank you for Let's your time. Thank you. Thanks.